Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with Mr. Snyder. Today we are going to be talking about the brain or our body's control center. And let's take a look at our learning targets for the day. The big one is going to be analyzing the parts of the brain and their functions and how they're grouped and classified to help you keep them straight. We're going to discuss how the cerebral cortex is divided. And then we're going to talk about the ways that researchers can study the brain. So without further ado, let's get started. The hindbrain, you can see the structure there. The hindbrain are our most basic body functions. That's where they're located. And we're going to be studying three out of this area. The first one is the medulla. And the medulla, which means marrow or inner substance, is located at the top of the spinal column. And this is the part of the brain that a person would least want to have damaged because it controls life-sustaining functions like heartbeat, breathing, swallowing, and uh, blood pressure. It is in the medulla that the sensory nerves coming from the left and right sides of the body cross over so that sensory information from the left side of the body goes to the right side of the brain and vice versa. And we'll talk more about that later. The pons is the larger swelling just above the medulla. And it's right there on the brain stem. This term means bridge, and the pons is a bridge between the lower parts of the brain and the upper sections. As in the medulla, there's a crossover of nerves, but in this case, it is the motor nerves carrying messages from the brain to the body. This allows the pons to coordinate the movements of the left and right sides of the body. The pons also influences sleep, dreaming, and arousal. The role that the pons plays in sleep and dreams will be discussed in more detail later on. And finally, in the hindbrain, the parts we'll be studying, is the cerebellum. It's at the base of the skull, behind the pons, and below the main part of the brain. It looks like a small brain, and cerebellum actually means little brain. It's the lower part of the brain that controls all involuntary involuntary rapid fine motor movement. People can sit upright because the cerebellum controls all the little muscles needed to keep them from fall falling out of their chair. It also coordinates voluntary movements that have to happen in rapid succession such as walking, diving, skating, gymnastics, dancing, typing, playing a musical instrument, and even the movements of speech. Learned reflexes, skills, and habits are stored in the cerebellum, which allow them to become more or less automatic. So because of the cerebellum, people don't have to consciously think about their posture, muscle tone, and balanced. And also, if the cerebellum is damaged, you will become very uncoordinated. Now as we get into the midbrain, we're going to start talking about um, basically one part that's involved in vision and hearing and it is the reticular activating system that comes up this section here called the reticular formation and the reticular activating system is inside this little bundle of nerves and it's an area of neurons running through the middle of the medulla and the pons and slightly beyond up here to the reticular activating system the, these neurons are responsible for people's ability to attend to certain kinds of information in their surroundings. Basically, the reticular, the reticular formation allows people to ignore the constant unchanging information, like the noise of the air conditioner in the classroom, and become alert to changes in information. For example, if the air conditioner in the classroom stopped, most people would notice immediately. And the reticular activating system is most important for arousal and alertness. It stimulates the upper part of the brain, keeping people awake and alert. When a person is driving along and someone suddenly pulls out in front of the vehicle, it's the reticular activating system that brings that driver to full attention. It is also the system that lets a mother hear her baby cry in the middle of the night, even though she's sleeping through other noises. The reticular activating system has also been suggested by brain scanning studies as a possible area involved in ADHD, in which children or adults have difficulty maintaining attention to a single task. And studies have also shown that when the reticular formation of rats is stimulated while they are sleeping, they awaken. If it is destroyed by lesioning, for example, they fall into a sleep-like coma from which they never awake and it's also implicated in comas in humans. 
And finally, we come to the forebrain, which is where our, it was the last part of our brain to develop, and it's where our processes for complex thinking take place. And we're going to study a variety of parts of this. So let's start with the thalamus. It's kind of like a relay station for sensory information. So in the emergency room of a hospital, for example, as an analogy, you go to the receptionist, but you'll have to wait to see a triage nurse before you get to see the doctor. The word triage is a process for sorting injured people into groups based on their need for or likely benefit from immediate medical treatment. Triage nurses ask people questions about their complaints. They may be able to partially treat minor complaints before the person sees the doctor. The thalamus is in some ways like a triage nurse. It's a round structure in the center of the brain that acts like a relay station for incoming sensory information. Like the nurse, the, thalus, the thalamus might perform some processing of that sensory information before sending it on to the part of the cortex, which we'll talk about in a second, that deals with that kind of sensation, hearing, sight, touch, or taste. Damage to the thalamus might result in the loss or partial loss of any or all of those sensations. The sense of smell is unique in that signals from the neurons in the sinus cavity go directly into special parts of the brain called olfactory bulbs, and we'll talk about those more later on. But those are just under the front of the brain, and it does not have to pass through the thalamus. The hypothalamus, hypo meaning under, is located under the thalamus. And it is a small but very, very, very powerful part of the brain. And it regulates body temperature, thirst, hunger, sleeping and waking, sexual activity, and emotions. And it sits right above the pituitary gland, which we'll learn about next section. That is the master gland because it functions, it controls the functions of all the other endocrine glands that will be discussed later. So the hypothalamus controls the pituitary, so the ultimate regulation of your hormones lies within the hypothalamus. The limbic system is actually all the hypothalamus, thalamus, hippocampus, and amygdala all together. And in general, it's involved in emotions, motivation, and learning. The cerebrum, not to be confused with cerebellum, but cerebrum makes up 70% of the brain's weight and is where the most conscious and intellectual activities take place. And the surface of this outer area is covered in wrinkles and edges, and this is called the cerebral cortex. It's the part of the brain most people picture when they think about what the brain looks like. It's tightly packed neurons, and it's actually one-tenth of an inch thick. And it's a grayish pink because the tightly packed neural bodies are gray, and the small blood vessels are pink. The cortex is full of wrinkles, because it allows a much larger area of cortical cells to exist in the small space inside the skull. This is the part that thinks, deals with memory, language, emotions, complex motor skills, perception, and more. So here's a picture of all of the parts that we've discussed inside the brain. Let's discuss the cerebral cortex. It's divided into hemispheres, a left side and a right side. The corpus callosum is the band of fibers connecting the two hemispheres. It allows the left and right hemispheres to communicate with each other. Each hemisphere can be roughly divided into four sections. And we're going to talk about those four sections right now. Let's start with the occipital lobe. It's at the base of the cortex, or the outer layer. Um, the term occipital refers to the rear of the head. This area processes visual information from the eyes. It's the part of the brain that also helps identify and make sense of visual information from the eyes. Have you ever wondered why people quote unquote see stars sometimes after being hit in the back of the head? It's because any stimulation to this back of the head processes vision and it will be interpreted as vision, hence the stars. The parietal lobe are at the top of the back of the brain, just under the parietal bone in the skull. This area contains the somatosensory cortex, which is an area of neurons running down the front of the parietal lobes on either side of the brain, and I'll get to those in a second. 
This area processes information from the skin and internal body receptors for touch, temperature, and body position. The somatosensory cortex is laid out in an interesting way, as we can see here. The top of the brain receives signals from the bottom of the body. And as we move down the area, the signals come from higher and higher in the body. It's almost as if there's a little upside down person laid out along that area of the cells. Going back, the temporal lobe, meaning of or near the temple of your head, are found just below the temples of the head. This lobe contains the auditory cortex and the auditory association area, and I'll get to those in a second. So if a person receives a blow to the side of their head, they'll probably hear a ringing sound. Also found in this left temporal lobe is an area that in most people is particularly involved with language. And the sense of taste also seems to be processed in the temporal lobe. And now finally we get to the frontal lobe, and that's at the front of the brain, hence the name frontal lobes. It often doesn't get this easy in psychology, so feel free to take a moment and appreciate it. Here is where all the higher mental functions of the brain, like planning, personality, memory, complex decision making, and in the left hemisphere of most people, areas devoted to language. It also helps in controlling emotions by key means of its connection to the limbic system. The frontal lobes also contain the motor cortex, a band of neurons located at the back of each lobe, as you can see in this drawing. Here's the sensory cortex, here is the motor cortex. If we look at the motor cortex, this is what does in your most, uh, this is what if you look in the motor cortex, you can see what mostly these things are doing. These cells control the movements of the body's voluntary muscles by sending commands out to the somatic div uh, division of the peripheral nervous system. The motor cortex is laid out just like the somatosensory cortex, which is right next door in the parietal lobe. Now let's discuss association areas. They're made up of neurons in the cortex that are devoted to making connections between the sensory information coming into the brain and stored memories, images, and knowledge. In other words, they help people make sense of the incoming sensory input. And although the association areas in the occipital lobe and temporal lobe have already been mentioned, much of the brain's association cortex is in the frontal lobe. Some special association areas are worth talking about in more details. Like Broca's area. In the left frontal lobe of most people is an area of the brain devoted to the production of speech. In a small portion of the population, it's in, right, it's in the right frontal lobe. More specifically, this area allows a person to speak smoothly and fluently. It is called Broca's area after the neurologist Paul Broca, who studied the damage to the area. Damage to Broca's area causes a person to be unable to get words out in a smooth, connected fashion. People with this condition may know exactly what they want to say and understand what they hear others say, but they cannot control the actual production of their own words. Speech is halting, and words are often mispronounced. In the left temporal lobe, again in most people, is an area called Wernicke's area, named after the physiologist Carl Wernicke, who studied problems arising from damage in this location. This, is the, this area of the brain appears to be involved in understanding the meaning of words. Left brain versus right brain is really getting carried away in psychology, some people believe that a person can be completely left-brained or completely right-brained, but the fact is that they both work together. The left hemisphere of your brain is more involved in logic, problem-solving, and mathematical computation. The right hemisphere is more creative with imagination, art, feelings, and spatial relations. And finally, we have our five ways of studying the brain. 
Our first one is an accident. We can't make somebody get into an accident, but an accident that causes a brain injury, such as Phineas Gage's accident, provides researchers with opportunities for learning how, about how these different parts of the brain function. A lesion is deliberately destroying a part of the brain. We can do that with animals to track how the damage affects certain behaviors. We can electrically stimu stimulate parts of the brain, and we can determine that way which areas of the brain respond to which sorts of sensations. We can also do what is called an EEG, which is recording the electrical activity of the cortex just below the skull. They can put um, small metal disc electrodes placed directly on the scalp using a little bit of jelly there. And these electrodes are connected to an amplifier and on a computer to view the information. And they look just like electrical waves. And finally, there are brain imaging equipment such as CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, and functional MRI, MRIs. They allow different areas of the brain in different ways to be recorded and then we can look at what area of the brain is being used when people do certain things, such as like looking at a photograph. And that is the end of this section. I know it was a long one, but it is important to know which parts of the brain do what, and I will see you tomorrow.